Good morning, students. Welcome to the Engineers Club of Dayton. On behalf of uh, our president, I'm Jim Matisse, president of the Hall of Fame, which is a separate entity from the club, but, but resides in the club, and I hope you all had a chance to see the Hall of Fame, which, uh, as the slide shows, goes back 40 years. This is our 40th anniversary of doing this, and we've honored in the course of that, uh, including last evening, some 70 great scientists and engineers. But I wanted just to uh, highlight what our mission is. It's twofold. Last night, we recognized and honored three great engineers and scientists that you will hear from today, either in the case of Nick, personally, or in the case of uh, the other two, uh, their representatives, since they have been deceased. Um, second, in the course of recognizing and honoring, it gives us the opportunity and the material uh, to motivate people such as you who've already chosen to learn about science and engineering and technology and math and all that good stuff. Uh, so that's the second part of our mission. So that's why you're here this morning and we hope it will be of great interest and possibly motivation. Prior years, we've received some direct feedback from students that in the course of getting to meet one or more of the greats, they, they remembered that and it was significant in their decisions ultimately to pursue careers in engineering and science. Uh, the medallion, I just want to say a word about it. Uh, it's a beautiful piece of metalwork and it basically shows the intertwining of science and engineering and the complementary disciplines that go with each. They are quite different, you know. Uh, when you go home, think a little bit about science. What drives science? The scientific method, the meticulous experimentation, risk-taking to make great breakthroughs, and the rigorous documentation of results. If you ever had a chance to look at some of the scientific inventions that are great, you'll be surprised to find that many of them were a result of an accident, an experiment left overnight cooking at a DuPont laboratory back in the 50s led to Teflon. So engineering, on the other hand, while it takes risks, the engineers that design and produce things have to minimize the risk to ensure that they work, like aircraft flying, for example. So that's something to think about. They're very complementary and we attempt to show and highlight the interrelationship of those disciplines and the results of each by recognizing some of these engineering and scientific greats. So with that, I'll get off the stage, introduce Tom Massbaum, our Master of Ceremonies for the day. Tom. Thank you, Mr. Matisse. Has anybody ever flown in an airplane? Yay, many of you. Okay, another one. Ridden in a car or driven a car? <laughs> okay. <laughs> ever cooked, be honest on this, have you ever cooked with stainless steel cookware? Come on, guys. I know you've helped mom out. <laughs> Looked into the world of nanotechnology. Something that I learned last night, nanotechnology, and some of you may have gotten into it, are very tiny particles. Uh, not quite down to particle physics. But this piece of paper is 10,000 nanometers thick. So we're talking about really small. What you're going to learn today through these three great scientists are things like who really created the first practical car, why airplanes don't fall apart or shatter even traveling at supersonic speeds, how nanotechnology can reduce costs, produce stronger and lighter wind turbines, improve fuel efficiency, and thanks to thermal insulation, of some nano components can even save energy, and so much more. So please sit back, take notes, and ask questions. As you can see, we have three speakers here this morning from Elwood Haynes, Dr. Nicholas Pagano, and Dr. Richard Smalley. So as I mentioned on our last slide, uh, our format here is that each of the speakers will have about 30 minutes to make a presentation. And then you'll have 10 minutes to ask questions. 
as you can see, Mr. Charles Sponigal, our first lecturer, is not a lightweight himself. You might look forward to this in your future careers. He will be presenting on behalf of Mr. Elwood Haynes. Please welcome Mr. Sponigal. All right, thank you, Tom. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as I said, I am uh, representing Elwood Haynes. Uh, I work for uh, a company by the name of Haynes International. It's in Kokomo, Indiana. And it was a company that Elwood Haynes started. And what I wanted to do this morning was talk a little bit about the things that Elwood Haynes accomplished in his life. And he lived 150 years ago. So we've got a pretty wide range of technological innovations over the last 150 years from the three people that uh, were inducted into the Hall of Fame last night. And Elwood was the first one in terms of, uh, he was born in 1857. So I want to give you a little bit of information about Elwood Haynes, the things he did, the accomplishments he made. But what I'd like for you to do is to kind of look at the timeline for the things that he did, his education, what kind of an education he got, and how he used it. And it, it covered a fairly broad range of, of um, applications. Uh, he was the, at least in the city of Kokomo, we claim he's the guy that invented the automobile. And that's a, that's a uh, well, he was very close to being the first guy that invented the automobile. And if you allow that, his automobile was actually designed from the ground up as an automobile, not as a carriage that was used for horses, a horse, horse drawn carriage. He really was the, the guy that was the first uh, uh, fellow with, with an automobile that was truly designed from the floor up as an automobile. Uh, he also was instrumental in uh, uh, natural gas development in the state of Indiana. In the late 1800s, there was a lot of natural gas discovered in Indiana. And he was instrumental in doing a lot of the things like that. So I want to go ahead and get started. Haynes was, was really a pioneer in many, many uh, uh, ways. He, as I said, he, he started out uh, interested in science. And remember, he was born in 1857, so that's before the Civil War. Um, his interest ranged, uh, it started off actually in, in the field of metallurgy. He was actually uh, trying to melt some brass and cast iron alloys when he was 15 years old. Uh, he was an entrepreneur. He started several companies. The, Haines that I, the, the company that I work for, Haynes International, was one that he started uh, after his uh, automotive uh, projects were started. He had a lot of inventions, a lot of patents throughout the years. And he was probably best known for his work in automobiles. That's what he's known by. But I think his biggest contributions were in his, uh, uh, in the field of metallurgy. Uh, he was actually a chemist uh, by schooling, but he did an awful lot of metallurgical work uh, in his career. And the company that I uh, uh, work for, Haynes International, is a producer of nickel and cobalt based alloys. As I said, he was born in Portland, Indiana in 1857, and that's where a lot of the natural gas deposits were found and why he was involved in the natural gas industry. He, intended, he attended uh, Worcester County Free Institute of uh, Industrial Science in Worcester, Massachusetts. Now, today that institute is known as Worcester Polytechnic, and it's a very, very well-respected university, uh, granting degrees through PhDs in a wide range of engineering and scientific uh, uh, fields. In fact, his thesis when he was at, uh, uh, in, in Worcester was uh, entitled The Effects of Tungsten and Iron on Steel. That was his senior project. And he was interested in trying to modify the characteristics of an ordinary piece of iron so that it could do things a lot more than just, uh, just be iron. You know? And he was a really interesting fellow in that uh, uh, he, he did a lot of, a lot of things that... Um, Mm, maybe not typical for someone of his, uh, his upbringing and, and 
his approach to school. He was admittedly a relatively poor student. He really hated mathematics. <laughs> and he had a lot of trouble in school. He went through about the eighth grade in uh, public schools and uh, then his parents strongly recommended that he get a job. So that's where he started his educational career. And he actually uh, uh, wound up uh, working for a few years. And then when he was 19 years of age, he went back to school for a couple of years to gain more information. He then went on to, to uh, Wooster and finally wound up uh, doing some graduate studies at John Hopkins University. So he had a very, very good education. Uh, it took a few years to get there, but he had a very good education and it really paid off. Uh, he actually came back from uh, John Hopkins and was head of chemistry department at uh, what is now Ball State University in, uh, in Indiana. During that time when he was in the uh, uh, oil and gas business, he did a lot of traveling and he did it with horse-drawn carriages and on horseback. And that's where he first got his idea about maybe I should build a car. <laughs> or something like that, so I don't have to ride a horse. And he actually started working on, on an automobile, and in uh, 1894, he actually had a vehicle with a one horsepower gasoline engine on it that he actually drove six or seven miles in Kokomo, Indiana. And that was the start of autom his automotive interests, and he started an automobile company uh, that lasted about 25 years and made some very, very high-end automobiles in 19... 10 or 1912, an automobile that he would have manufactured would have cost about $1,200. So that's a lot of money back then. Now, the, uh, as I said, he, he's well known for his cars, he's well known for his work in the oil and gas industry, but I think the most important thing that he did was in the field of uh, metallurgy. He invented a number of cobalt alloys. That was probably the first real invention that he had, and he got patents on them in 1907 and 1912. And these were cobalt-based materials, not a common material, not something you see every day, uh, but they have very unique characteristics. And they wound up uh, used in all kinds of applications, uh, things involving uh, um, uh, in, in any place where uh, a lot of wear resistance was needed, a lot of corrosion resistance was needed, a lot of high temperature uh, strength was needed and things like that. And today, the alloys that he invented and inspired are found in all kinds of applications. As you can see, it covers a very, very wide range of products. The Saturn V program had about 28,000 pounds of the alloys that he invented and inspired on each, uh, each Apollo flight. So these things were used in a very, very wide range of uh, of applications, and it's because of the unique characteristics of those alloys that they were used. And that's the technology that he was involved in. Admittedly, it's not anywhere near as complicated as the technology that we face today. And that's really what I wanted to, to get to in, in, in the presentation that I have, is what does technology mean? When I use the word technology, I cover all of the fields that are involved in, STEM, in a STEM education, uh, we, are, we are faced with, a tech, with technology that is sometimes pretty hard to understand, and it's only going to get more complicated as you go forward. In your lifetime, there will be technologies that are available that make what we have today look like child's play. What I wanted to do was to take a particular technology, communications, and, and look at what happened over, a, let's say, a thousand years. And we'll go back to the year 1000 and, and talk about how did people communicate? What was the technology of communication? And it was a voice. And at that time, you didn't have lapel mics. So when you talk to people, maybe you could talk to 100 people, something like that. Four or 500 years later, the printing press was invented. Now, people had a way to communicate by writing a book or writing a newspaper or something like that. And so you had the ability for someone who was a publisher to talk to hundreds or thousands of people. Admittedly, it, take a lo it, it would take a long time to get a newspaper delivered from one part of the country to the other, but at least you could, you could communicate with thousands of people at one time. Uh, a few hundred years later, the telegraph was invented. And now, 
a skilled operator could talk to someone else a far distance away almost instantaneously. So improvements are made along the way. Now, just about anybody could talk to another individual, communicate almost instantly over long distances. 1920 was the first uh, licensed commercial radio station. Think about what happened there. Now, the radio announcer could talk to tens of thousands of people over the long distances, virtually instantaneously. Commercial television, 1950. 4% of the houses in the United States in 1950 had a, te had a television. And now, with the picture being worth a thousand words, a television announcer could talk to hundreds of thousands of people, or maybe even millions of people, and give them vast amounts of information very, very quickly over long distance. So you can see the, the improvement in the ability of people to communicate, all caused by increases in technology. Uh, 1980, the personal computer. And that's probably the, the, the beginning of the second phase of our technological existence. Uh, that personal computer revolutionized so many things that we do. Ten years or so later, the World Wide Web was invented. Now, you could talk to just about anybody, anywhere, any, any person could, with the right, uh, the right abilities, could now reach millions of people. And that's a, a, a seminal change in the ability to communicate. Uh, up until that point, the only people that could do the communicating were the people who owned television stations, radio stations, and so on, or the publisher of a newspaper or whatever. With the advent of the World Wide Web and social media, Facebook and all of those things that we have today, we've taken communications from me talking to you one-on-one uh, -on -one to where anybody in this room that has a cell phone can pull it out and talk to millions of people or even billions of people instantaneously sending huge amounts of information just about anywhere. And if you look at this little uh, timeline, one of the things you notice that each successive advance occurred sooner and sooner. And that's the thing that is, I think, most important in understanding the importance of a STEM education. Because these things will continue to become more and more and more important even though they're very important for everybody right now, and everybody has a, a Twitter, well, I don't have a Twitter account, but a lot of people have Twitter accounts. But the importance of that is, is you, you can't overstate it today. It, it has done so many things, basically communicating ideas, uh, beliefs, and things like that, some good, some bad. Good and bad come with the technological advances, and that's one of the, one of the things that is is concerning to some degree, I think. Now, I wanted to talk about uh, five particular areas that I think are important. They're not the only areas, uh, technological areas that, uh, that are growing, but these are five areas that I think are really, really important. And, and some of these have been around for a long time. Medicine's been around for thousands of years. It's been practiced way, way, 6,000 years ago at least. Microprocessor electronics, about 50 years old or so something in that neighborhood. Uh, genomics is a brand new 20 or 30 years old, the study of human DNA. Machine learning, artificial language, or artificial intelligence. Um, that's been around for 40 or 50 years. At least the artificial intelligence side of things has been. Only in the last very few years have we begun to look into machine learning, artificial intelligence. And that's a very, very important uh, advance. Quantum processing and computing, this is really very, very new, and there's, a not, there's not a lot known about what it's going to be able to do, but there are some kinds of problems that a quantum computer can solve in five minutes that the world's fastest non-quantum computer would take a period of time equal to hundreds of billions of years to solve. Those kind of advances will be 
are, are facing everybody today. And, and I think there are uh, a, a number of things that will occur that uh, they're, they're probably going to be a little bit difficult to, uh, to handle. Uh, I've got some information that I wanted to share with you here on some of the capabilities that, that we have. When you look at things like microprocessor electronics, uh, it started about 50 years ago, and one of the first chips that was produced was an Intel chip, the Intel 4004. Uh, it had 2,300 transistors on it. That was quite an achievement in 1970 or 71. Uh, it operated at a speed of 740 kilohertz, so it was a real, a, a real uh, advance. Today, I think the Apple M1 and M2 Ultra chips that are used on some of the Mac uh, uh, computers, it has 114 billion transistors on it and runs at 3,400 megahertz. The Intel 404 chip was a 4-bit processor. The Apple, I think, is probably a 64-bit processor huge increases, millions of times greater capability over the period of 50 years. If you look at the, the study of genomics, uh, studying a human DNA, uh, DNA has been, was, was discovered, I guess, in what, 1953 or so, something like that. And in the year 2000, uh, we were at the point where we could read the human genome. You could get a sequencing of the human genome. In 2001, to sequence a human genome cost about $95 million. Today, 20 years later, we can sequence a human genome for less than $500. Now, these advances are the result of technology. Science and engineering and technologists and mathematicians doing the things that they do. It's moved us forward a huge amount and where we are today, uh, some might say, well, you know, we're at the end now. We've got the fastest computer in the world. Uh, we've got social, we've got all of this stuff. And that's it. You can't, do any, you can't go any faster than that. You can't make chips that are any more complicated than what we have. You know, we're down to two nanometer traces now uh, in, in microprocessors. None of them are out on the market yet, but they will be in a couple of years two nanometers. So we can't go any, I don't think, well, can we go any bit, well, I, I don't know. Yeah, the answer is probably we're going to go way beyond that, and that's the thing that I wanted to, to try to finish up with. Uh, when you look at, uh, at genomics, uh, that's a brand new field, and we have uh, the ability now with some of the gene splicing techniques to insert uh, a new gene, a new DNA uh, a sequence into a human embryo. There's a technique called CRISPR that can do that. And there's a lot of concern about the technology behind it. What are we going to do with that? Well, there are a lot of uh, diseases that are caused by a single gene uh, mix-up. CRISPR could probably fix it, but CRISPR can probably also provide you with a baby that has blue eyes and blonde hair and is a good athlete. The, that's, that's the real fear that uh, a lot of people might have, and you look at all of the moral and ethical concerns about technology and ask yourself the question, can we do these things? Can we do all of these new things? And the answer is absolutely yes, we will be able to. And ask yourself the question, should we? Well, if you talk to the parents of a child with cystic fibrosis, which is caused by a single miscoding, uh, a single base pair that can be fixed, or it will be able to be fixed in the future, the answer is going to be, of course, we need to do this. And the question of will we actually do it, and I think probably we're not going to be able to stop it.
no matter what, it, what anybody really thinks, I doubt that we'll be able to stop the progress. And that's what technology is going to do. It's going to have its good things and its bad things, but it's going to be in your future for sure. Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. So you talked about a, a lot about microchips and stuff like that. Is the community more worried about making cost-efficient products or better products in general, more efficient uh, compu computation of information? Uh, it is a, it's a combination of things. and it's going to be, There's going to be more new things. For example, when you look at microprocessor applications, there are all kinds of things. Your cell phones and stuff like that. The real change is going to be in the future is going to be microprocessor applications coupled with machine learning, artificial intelligence, and it'll produce a car that will be able to drive itself. It's going to be a brand new thing like that. The cost of things will continue to come down. Look at electronics in general. Uh, the, the, the tremendous reductions in cost of electronic components, and that will continue for the components themselves. What they're used for may be a little bit different. The use will be to produce new applications. The actual technology behind uh, the, the process itself, microelectronics, is probably to reduce cost. Okay, hey, anyone else? Anybody else? All right, thank you very much. All right, well, we're getting set up here with, for uh, Dr. Nick Pagano. Just a little bit about his background. Um, he is considered to be more than a leading expert in the field of composites. It's unlikely that you have not used some kind of composite material in your life. If you have ever ridden a bike, <laughs> If you have ever skied, if you've ever played golf, you have used composite materials. He has developed composites and testing methods for composites for aircraft traveling at supersonic speeds where stress and fabrication, stresses on the fabrication materials is extreme. It's a new technologies for belts. I think we're <laughs> I think we're ready to go. So if you will please Welcome, Dr. Nick Pagano. Wow, that's amazing. Well, good morning. When I was your age, I thought my uh, career would be that of a pin setter. You're probably asking, I'll, I'll tell you the answer. What's a pin setter? In a bowling alley, people knock pins down. Somebody has to put them back up. Well, it doesn't have to be a person because the job doesn't exist anymore. Machines pick up the pick up the pins and get out of the way. <laughs> but that's what I was going to do. I used to make ten cents for every game that I set up the pins for. And I could get as many as a hundred games a night. I, I used to work nights when I was in high school, not, not STEM school, just high school. Uh, and that, uh, I found a better job. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. What is, what is that better job? In particular, I'm going to 
discuss the first paper I ever wrote on composite materials. Well, first of all, this is going to be a teaching, so I'm going to sign a homework exercise. And uh, that exercise is to do a search on your computer of this topic, the 20 greatest engineering achievements of the 20th century. 20, the 20 greatest achievements, engineering achievements of the 20th century. And the reason is to what your knowledge about what field you want, want you're, you still probably don't know what field you're going into. I know you're not going to be pen setters. They don't exist anymore. But uh, I want you to look at those 20 and evaluate them. See if you can find a place for yourself in that field, at least temporarily, you need a direction to start. And that would be a good place. And I won't ask you any questions other than that, because all your answers, I could ask you to rate those 20, pick the most, most uh, most important one, and all your answers would be right. So there's no use asking. The real topic of today's uh, teaching, you see it on the screen. This is uh, a paper Influence of Unconstrained in the Testing of Anisotropic Bodies was published in 1968. And it was my first paper. I co-authored it with Dr. John Halpin, who did the testing. And I did the analysis of the testing. Somebody said uh, about my work, this was a friend. Um, when Nick tells you he has the exact solution of something, he doesn't really mean, he doesn't mean it's the real solution. In a sense, that's true. As funny as it sounds, what it means is the mathematics is exact. I didn't make the composite. I can't tell you if it has some imperfections in it or some fibers that may not be in the exact right, uh, correct place. I can tell you how that material would behave according to the theory of elasticity. And if I get the solution of that problem in the theory of elasticity, that's my exact solution. And um, you're going to see a lot of equations here, but I'm just going to blitz through the equations and emphasize the physics. So we'll, you, you want to pay attention to the figures and, uh, and, and to, to capture the essence of this story. So here's a... Um, outline of my presentation. Uh, what's the problem? How did we solve it? Well, I told, already told you we're going to use it. It's actually the two-dimensional theory of elasticity because the specimens we're talking about are very thin. And um, there's no th three-dimensional effect here. Here's something that, that I'm talking about. In, uh, on the, le the left, hand, left hand side, this side, a uh, characteristic mo um, movement of an anisotropic material. Anisotropic means 
the properties are dependent on the direction. If the material is isotropic, the properties, the material properties, are the same in all directions. So in, in anisotropic materials, we have a phenomenon called shear coupling. And it's, it's shown on the left side. If I apply a uniform state of stress, as shown by the arrows up and down, tension, that material will suffer rotation. There'll be a, a, and we call that strain, shear strain, given by that angle gamma with some subscript, which I can't read. <laughs> but that uh, is an important characteristic of anisotropic materials that people are not used to. Well, at least they weren't in 1968. How do you test that material? If you put it in a, a, a machine and clamp the ends, you restrain that shear distortion from occurring. In other words, if, if you clamp the end, you get a, distort, a, dis, a de deformation pattern as you, uh, uh, that you would see on the right-hand side. And that's not going to give you the right answer when you, when you, uh, you break down the data. But we see, in order for that, in the right-hand side picture, there is a picture of the deformation, which we just think of by intuition because of the forces that act on the ends, and uh, they consist of two forces. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have a free body diagram, and there's two forces and couples as well, bending couples, bending. And those uh, are responsible for that predicted Def, uh, uh, displacement field. So, on the left, that's what's supposed to happen. On the right, that does happen. The question is, can we predict what does happen? And we start with the theory of elasticity, and I told you I'm not going to go over all the equations, but this is a theory that in general contains 15 uh, uh, equations and uh, 15 unknowns at every point in the body, plus boundary conditions. So that's why I'm not describing the math today. This is just the math that we did to predict that displacement field on the right. Yeah, OK, go ahead. Yeah. Yep, go ahead. OK. Okay, let's keep going. Yeah. Someday you'll understand this math. <laughs> I won't ask you any questions on it. Okay, now let's get that picture in there. Okay. Dr. Halpin is an expert in elastomers and rubbers. So what we did was make a, our specimen out of a rubber matrix and nylon fibers to magnify the displacements that occur. If we used a real uh, structural composite, you, wouldn't, you couldn't see the displacements. They're so small. But in the rubber, they're visible. In fact, we can draw on the surface of that black rubber with a white pen and see what's happening. This is what we predict would happen. And then, okay. Okay. Yeah. 
So here's, here's a, a, one of the specimens where we, uh, not me, they drew lines on it to indicate the unde, unde, un, unloaded state. You can see on the left side how, what the distortion pattern is. And, um, whether we have fixed clamps, in other words, those clamps on the bottom and top are always horizontal, that can rotate on the right-hand figure, and uh, the, the results are practically identical. There's little difference. In other words, the model is working. And uh, we're gonna see if we can predict that that pattern, <clears throat> then, uh, and we did. The next question is, what happens when we change the angle of the fibers? The fibers in that first, on the left hand, yeah, your left hand side, are at 30 degrees to the vertical axis. The second one is 60 degrees, and the third one is 75 degrees. So you can see the difference. What happened at 60 degrees? We see no shear, no, no shear distortion at all. So that, that shear coupling is zero for the 60 degree angle. And the next one, the 75 degree angle, the lines are rotating clockwise, whereas before they rotated counterclockwise, so the sign of the shear coupling reversed. And here's uh, some more figures. What happens when uh, we change the length to width ratio, and again, we were able to predict that with the theory of elasticity. And uh, we reach a very important conclusion if the length to width ratio is infinity, the stresses are constant. But, but you still get the deformation, you still get the S pattern shape uh, deformed body. So all that, all that shows is that we can understand what happens when we clamp up a body, or a, a composite body in a testing machine and do a test. If it were isotropic, it would be simple. We say P over A is the stress, there's only one stress. The, Transverse deformation is negative because that's uh, uh, called the Poisson effect. But in the case of an anisotropic material, we have to be very careful. If you want to do that test, you have to use my equations. If if you clamp the ends, or you can actually devise a system where the clamping, there is no clamping. <clears throat> and that's the one shown on the right here, not, not very clear, but it's shown on the right. What happened on the bottom and here and top, we have punched holes in the rubber and have fish hooks, real fish hooks, <laughs> and, and, uh, and we're loading it that way so that we allow the rotation to occur. So there, away from those fish hooks, some distance, we're going to get a uniform field. And the shear will be in accordance with that shear coupling coefficient. 
But you can't do that with a real composite. You can't go punching a lot of holes in it. And so the question is, how do you do it? And, uh, yeah, the answer is study this paper, learn what's, what's wrong with conventional testing, and the second and the third thing is what 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 uh, composite do we use instead of a thirty degree composite where the fibers are at thirty degrees, make it a angle ply plus or minus thirty, and do the analysis on that. There there will be no shear anywhere in that in that specimen. These are conclusions which I just wrote after uh, 1968. It's 32, it's 40, 40, 50, 50, 56 years ago. Uh, I wrote these conclusions. Since the publication of this paper, we have seen no one trying to use off angle. I call that off angle. That's the the angle of the fibers is not zero or 90, something in between. And uh, we have se we've seen no one trying to do that test inc incorrectly. And uh, for the experimental character, how do you do, what do you do? The, that's what you don't do. What you do is make, make an angle ply composite and use one of my other theories of uh, laminates, which I can't go into today, and calculate the stresses and strains in every layer of the laminate. Thanks for, uh, yeah. Uh, I thank you for sitting there the whole time because I know it's painful watching uh, people that can't control their own uh, video. But if you have questions. I'm assuming that most composites started out at 90 degrees, right? And my question is, how did you get to the 30 degrees and what other angles did you do besides 30 and 90? Well, the specimens were made uh, with nylon fibers and rubber matrix, and I didn't have anything to do with that. I just said, make me a 30 degree specimen. Uh, so, uh, I'm, not sure what, I'm not sure what the details of your question are. Uh, but this is a hand operation uh, to, to to make these experimental specimens. Well, I, I, I guess I wanted to make sure that the students understand that beginning composites like plywood and all those kind of com basic composites were all at 90 degrees. Am I correct at that? Um, um, the, the, uh, the rubber, the purpose of the rubber and nylon composite in the first place is just to show that we can predict this Phenomena in 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 situations where the strains are ten times higher than they're going to be in a normal composite material. That proves the theory, and now you apply the theory. Okay, to, I got you. Thank you. To the real composite. What was your initial response when you got entered into the Hall of Fame? Uh, a surprise, uh, shock, um, hum humility. Because, as I told the audience last night, uh, my role models were my parents, my father's motto was there's no such word as can't. 
There's no such word as C-N-A-T, apostrophe T. There's no such word. And I've, I've believed that. People told me I can't do something, and I did it. So that's, uh, that's the way I acted. They told me I could, I could never publish. I should never get a, a uh, patent for a theory. So I did it. That was another paper. <laughs> At the age of 89, what keeps you going that you still want to give a lecture at this kind of forum? I think that would be inspirational for many of these students who will, 30, 40, or even 50 years from now, be thinking of giving a lecture. So I want you to inspire them. What inspires you now? Forty years from now, this, this paper will still be in the journal Composite Materials. And uh, it's been reprinted in other uh, books and things. This'll, this is uh, just like a dictionary. And um, they may have a different border on them. On the, on, the, on the book, but the paper, the words won't change in 40 years. Well, I think what you're saying is that that paper will end up being Pagano's Law. <laughs> oh. I still can think composites. I can't do anything. I used to say my hands, because I'm not physically gifted, but my brain has always worked, and, it's, and it still works. It forgets things, but it still works. And in fact, I know of about three projects I'd like to continue, but I no longer can do the math. <laughs> so I need some student help to, uh, to carry out these new ideas that I have. I think they're very good ideas and uh, they'll, they'll be technologically sound, mathematically exact, and capable of experimental verification time and time again. Thank you so much, Dr. Bagano. No, it's for all my <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I will not attempt to explain nanotechnology or carbon nanotubes. I'll leave that to Dr. Benji Mariyama the Principal Materials Research Engineer and Air Force Research Laboratory Materials and Manufacturing Directorate. As you can see, Benji has quite a list of his own accomplishments that you might want to consider when making your own career choices. <laughs> Please welcome Dr. Benji Maruyama. Thanks, Tom. Thanks very much. All right, good morning, everyone. Very excited to be here. Um, and very excited also to be able to talk to you about uh, not just the legacy of uh, Dr. Rick Smalley, uh, but where we think this is going in the future. And um, so about 20 years ago, Professor Smalley, Rick, everybody called him Rick, uh, was in this hall and talked to students like you, but 20 years ago. And what was great about Rick, one of his superpowers was that he could talk to people, communicate to people about very complex things like nanotechnology, and they would come away inspired and motivated. And so my hope is to get to just a small fraction of that. Uh, but the last slide that Rick showed in this room was this saying right here, be a scientist, save the world. 
And last night, Chad was talking about that at dinner uh, and said, you know, and, and Rick asked him, so Chad is, is, is Rick's son, uh, along with Preston, Hazel Cole from Rice University, uh, and said, so do you think this is over the top? And I think Chad said, nope. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So some, some uh, background here, right? So Rick passed away, unfortunately, in 2005. Um, but if you look at it, the Nobel Prize that he got, Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1996, um, came as a result of a six-week project in the summer of 85, a paper that was only two pages long, but it changed the world and started nanotechnology. He did that with Professor Robert Curl and Sir Harold Croto. And one of the interesting things about thinking about the background here, and so here's a, here's a model, an atom model of a, of a buckyball. So imagine each of these black balls is a carbon atom. Now shrink it down so that this is super, super tiny, right? Only tens of atoms across. And so what happened was Rick was slamming a piece of graphite carbon with a laser, and he got this mess out of it. But there was a strange peak right there in his spectrum that measured how many carbon atoms were in the stuff that came off of the, the target. And there were 60 atoms, not 59 atoms, not 61 atoms. There were 60 carbon atoms. And uh, I think Curl it was, was looking at the stars and trying to figure out why he was getting some of these strange spectra. He couldn't figure it out. He tried all these different molecules, all these different arrangements of atoms that could give rise to that spectrum, could not figure it out. And so what happened is they sat down, Rick and students and, and collaborators, and got a piece of paper, some scissors, and some tape and started trying to figure out how to get these 60 carbon atoms together. And they thought about chains, and they thought about ribbons, and they thought about all these different things, until eventually somebody came up with the idea of this Buckminster fullerene, the C60 fullerene, which is basically a soccer ball. And so there are pieces of paper up here. If you want to make your own buckyball, uh, grab one after the talk. But it was that leap of figuring out, OK, I've got, I've got something going on here. I don't know what it is, and sitting down and thinking about it and figuring it out. Um, that was back in the 80s. But really, what I want to talk about for the rest of the time is what Rick spent the rest of his career on, and that is the carbon nanotube. Could you hold that up, please? So this carbon nanotube, now it's another atom model. And instead of, I'll come grab it, actually. So instead of a ball, you take the ball, you cut it in half, and you extend it. And you get this molecule that is a perfect carbon molecule. And guess what? So the carbon fibers that Nick talked about, and by the way, I should say that I'm doubly fortunate because not only did I have the opportunity to work with Professor Smalley, uh, but I also got to work with uh, Dr. Pagano, Nick Pagano, uh, back when I was a young punk, and, uh, uh, and, and learned a lot. So Rick spent the rest of his career on this, this molecule, this carbon nanotube. Why? Because it's amazingly strong and stiff and lightweight. And uh, Rick would, would go around saying, not only is this the strongest material ever, but it's the strongest material that will ever be. And you kind of have to have a Nobel Prize to be able to make an assertion that big. Uh, but Rick was absolutely right, the strongest material that will ever be. Other amazing properties is that it can conduct electricity better than copper. If you imagine the high tension wires that carry the electric power, the overhead cables, uh, one nanotube, and Rick would go and when he was talking to Congress people, and, and he would say, look, I want nanotubes, and I want them to be assembled about in something about the size of my pen here. And they will conduct as much electricity as 100 copper cables. 
without electric loss. And so that saves so much power that that makes a huge difference. So I'm actually gonna pass this around. I'll start back with you guys. If you wanna pass it around, please. Thanks. So how do we get to saving the world then? So Rick got together with a bunch of people and said, what are the top 10 problems facing humanity? And so here they are, energy, water, food, environment, poverty, terrorism and war, disease, education, democracy, population. So how do nanotubes do that? Um, and let's start looking at that. So how can carbon nanotubes save the world? So there's um, a program that started at Rice University. Um, so this is with Matteo Pasquale and folks at Shell Oil. Um, and you would think Shell Oil, how is Shell Oil going to save the world? Uh, because they're the ones who are producing the oil and gas, natural gas. And so the idea, and this is supported by a, a, a government project in RPE, where you take natural gas, which is mostly methane. What's the methane molecule? It's carbon and hydrogen, and you split it. You make it into hydrogen, and now if everybody knows about hydrogen, that's a clean energy, right? When you burn hydrogen, you get water. There's no CO2, there's no global warming. And what you do then is you take the carbon atom and you make carbon nanotubes. But you don't do it in just little bits, right? Right now we can make carbon nanotubes that maybe grams, pounds, something like that, but you have to be able to make it at hundreds of millions of tons per year. Right now, actually, if, if anyone has a cell phone, you probably have carbon nanotubes in the lithium ion battery that powers your cell phone. So that's one of the things that carbon nanotubes are being used in today. But to, make, to save the world, we need to learn how to make carbon nanotubes at hundreds of millions of tons per year. Because when we do that, we will reduce global CO2 emissions by 20 to 40% per year. And that right there is the save the world proposition. So enough to save the planet, but guess what? We don't have the science. We don't have the science to make nanotubes at scale. The materials is holding things up. And let me just give a little plug for materials. I think you know, the three talks that, that we're hearing today are all about materials, right? Stainless steel, composite materials. Um, and in fact, even the airplane, so the Wright Brothers airplane, um, their, their secret weapon was, you know, people had thought about flight and they did a lot on controlled flight. Uh, what's less appreciated is that the motor, the internal combustion that they had, the engine that they had, had a new aluminum alloy. So it was materials uh, that made the difference there. Composite uh, aircraft, that's due to the work that Nick and others did. The other way to think of it though, is that materials is holding things back. We can have better phones and better airplanes and you know, self-driving cars. A lot of that technology is actually held up by materials and technology not advancing fast enough. So, it's not just we need to go faster because we want things to be better. In this case, we need to get global warming down, climate emissions, by the year 2050. We have less than 30 years to do that. And materials generally take 30 or so years to develop, to get into market. If I have the idea today, it's like 30 years before we can get it going. So how do we get this to go faster? How do we make science go faster? So let's start with, with what's wrong with problem. And the hint there is it's actually a people problem. We think of it as technology and that's part of it, but a lot of it is actually the people problem. So um, on the right you see uh, General Charles Q, Charles Q. Brown is chief of staff of the Air Force and in his strategic uh, approach document from 2020 he said accelerate change or lose. So business as usual, the way we normally do, and I take this for science, the way we normally do science is not fast enough. And if we don't get going faster, we will lose. Secretary of Defense Mark Esper had this other quote here that talked about um, these recent advances. So artificial intelligence, AI, uh, is being used 
for automating, making chemistry autonomous, self-driving labs, sometimes they're called uh, for a lot of different national security applications. But it's the people aspect that I put in bold there. So what is it about the AI that's great? What it does is these advances free up time for our scientists and researchers to focus on next generation innovation rather than countless tests and experiments. So let that sink in for a bit. The thing about AI is not to put researchers out of work, it's about letting us do the kind of science, the part of science that we want to do, that we like to do, and that we can't get to because we're doing all these countless tests and, and experiments. The other part to the people problem is that they're not enough of us doing science. They're not enough of us doing research. So here's a quote from a paper in 2019. Children lose confidence in their potential to be scientists, but not in their capacity to do science. So that's really important, and I think that's important for all of us, not just students, uh, but those are of us who are later in our career. And, and this is you know, especially true amongst underrepresented groups, girls, uh, minorities, and children from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. This is really a problem that we have to go after. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about after this is, is thinking about workforce and how we, you, going forward, get to participate and be valued um, as human beings and as researchers. And so right now, we don't have enough people going into science and technology. STEM fields are lacking. So if you, go to, if you look at graduate schools, there are fewer and fewer US students who are going to grad school, fewer and fewer who are going into research. And why is that? That's because the value proposition is not there anymore. It used to be, you know, sure, I'm gonna sit there and polish samples and do test tubes or wash test tubes for forever and ever, and, and getting the degree was enough. Uh, but guess what? That doesn't work in today's society. We need to reset our expectations for how science is done, how academic work is done to really meet the modern world. And so that means valuing workforce for uh, their humans, for their insight, creativity, and human intelligence or else people who can do STEM will go to Google or Facebook or Wall Street or someplace where you can make lots of money. And sure, you can make lots of money, but doing scientific research is a lot more fun. So our thought is to make research more accessible with what we're calling the One Billion Scientist Movement. I'll talk about that a little bit. But the bottom line here is really about diversity, equity, and inclusion. We need to make science be more diverse, more equitable, and more inclusive. And we need to not just say that, we need to make it an imperative to what we do. We need to make, be intentional and impactful about all our actions in this area. So how are we gonna do research faster? And not just a little bit faster, a thousand times faster. So the hint there is artificial intelligence robots with lasers. It sounds like science fiction, uh, but it's actually right where we're at right now, and I'll show you that. So here's a robot that we built. It took a 3D printer and attached a camera to it. And right now it's printing out a square and it's trying to adjust all the printers. I don't know if you ever tried a 3D printer, set it out, said print something and it messed up, right? It failed. And that's because it, there are all these things that you have to adjust. You have to adjust the print speed and the pressure and all these different things. Well here, the robot keeps on printing something out and taking a picture and then doing some image analysis to see where it went wrong. And then it uses an artificial intelligence and AI algorithm to say, oh, okay, well, that one didn't work, let's try this. And then it goes in and tries that. It reprints another one, and it does it over and over and over again. And each time it uses that artificial intelligence algorithm on the batch of things that it just did and says, okay, knowing what just happened, I'm gonna try this next. I'm gonna adjust this parameter. So it is a robot 3D printer that taught itself how to print. So this is very exciting for us. Uh, we, we were the first ones um, to do this uh, in material science in general. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but when we think about making things more accessible, 
what we want to do is make these robots accessible to everyone, to make them cheaper, to make them open source. Um, and so what we're trying to work on now, and we're actually working on that uh, with Superintendent Smith from DECA um, about doing an educational ARIES, fully autonomous, self-learning 3D printer that we can get into schools for $300. The software is open source, parts you can buy on Amazon, and now once we get that into the hands of students, they can go and try things, right? You can go and try things and say, um, I think I have a better way of doing this, or I want to put a different camera in, I want to try a different egg. Whatever it is, that's now open for you to hack, to improve, and to teach other people how to do things. So that's very exciting for us. Our software is out there uh, on, on a GitHub if anybody's interested in checking it out. But what we're trying to do is up in the upper right corner where anyone can download their autonomous research robot um, from the Air Force Research Lab. So a little bit more into the, this, this autonomous experimentation. So, so we were the first ones to do this for, um, for material science, the first one to build an autonomous research robot. And we did it with carbon nanotubes trying to figure out again, how do we make these carbon nanotubes faster, better? How do we understand the science? And so we built this robot that uses a laser to heat up a little piece of silicon. And so it provides the heat to grow the carbon nanotubes. We have a catalyst on top of it. We give it the methane to, as the carbon source to make it. And then the other thing we do is we have a spectrometer that collects that laser light and tells you what just happened. So on the 3D printer, we have a camera that takes an image and sees what happened. Here we have something called a Raman spectrometer that tells you what just happened. And over hundreds of experiments, you can see that eventually Aries taught itself how to grow carbon nanotubes at controlled rates. So that was exciting for us. We figured out we had essentially a first closed loop, fully autonomous research robot. Um, very exciting. There were issues with it. It was the first try. We're, we're trying to get better about it. Uh, but in the process, we started thinking about what does it mean to be an autonomous research robot. And so you can see it's this idea of like, okay, the AI algorithm has to decide what to do next, right? The autonomy is about delegation of decision authority. You do the experiment, and then you have to see what happened. And then you go back and iterate, you loop, and say, okay, now I know a little more. Here's what I want to get to. I want a controlled rate or a better nanotube and now I'll do a new iteration and keep going. And this one goes hundreds of times faster than a human can do it. In my lab, if you go in there, we do it the old fashioned way, we get one experiment a day. With Aries, we did 100 experimental iterations a day. But not only were, they, were we doing experiments faster, but each time our AI algorithm was thinking about, okay, well, what about the temperature? What about the pressure? What about the hydrogen? What about the methane? Every five minutes, it was making decisions in high dimensional parameter space that humans can't make that fast. So we need these research robots not to replace us, but to help us answer the questions that we want to answer. And so that's the thing in this block over here where it says initialize. The humans are the ones who decide what to work on, right? Like on any autonomous. Uh, self-driving car, the car doesn't tell you where to go, you tell the car where to take you. And then at the end, right, the humans are the ones who take those results and figure out, okay, this is what it means to me, this is where we go next with it. So there's a whole movement now in AI for science, and uh, so there's Professor Hiroaki Kitano from Japan who issued this Nobel Turing Challenge. So the Nobel Prize, right, Alan Turing, uh, who has uh, uh, worked in the UK uh, on the Enigma project. Um, so, the, so Kitano's challenge is, can we build a machine that can win a Nobel Prize by the year 2050? So that's a big challenge. But um, let me point you to this other part here. Scientific discovery is at the pre-industrial revolution level. So that means that pre-industrial revolution, 
we didn't have tractors. We didn't have satellite-driven decisions about where we plant and when we plant. We had people and plows and horses and oxen, right? That's where we are today, according to Kitano, and I tend to believe him. So who's gonna do the research in the, in the future? And so my, my contention is more of us. Let's think about that. So um, two different revolutions. So I talked about the Industrial Revolution. That was really about power. That was about machines being able to move things and multiply human labor, human physical force, by 100 or 1,000 times. And that enabled uh, lots, lots better farming, for example, but you know, motor cars, vehicles, all those kinds of things. The cognitive revolution, so that's about having machines that help you think and compute, is really about uh, the upper level there. So when you said computer back in the 1940s, people in the 1940s were referring to people, human computers. And this was rooms full of people, mostly women, who were Imagine doing math all day as your job and building out trig tables. That was their job until the computer came along, right? what we call the computer. And so this is a picture of Melba Roy. So if you've ever watched the movie Hidden Figures, anybody seen that movie? So um, she was um, a subject of the human uh, computers and they were tracking the echo satellites for NASA in the 1960s. That was a huge advance. Now, that was a supercomputer of their day. The computers that we have in our pockets are much, much more powerful than those computers ever were. So, okay, we found a way to, to do our human labor, right, our, our manual labor, and we have a way to do our cognitive work. Let's put that together now into the research revolution. So, the left is a picture of Madame Marie Curie. Uh, she won two Nobel Prizes, one in physics, one in chemistry. And you can see her there with a, a flask and pouring chemicals. That was um, in the early 1900s. Fast forward to today, you go in the lab today and there are lots of us there still doing the same thing. We're pouring chemicals in flasks, we're watching, washing test tubes. How is that still a thing? So what we're trying to do is change that so that we have research robots who work together with human researchers and they do the transferring of samples, the manual work, but they also do the high level reasoning using artificial intelligence to help us think about all this data that we have, all the possible theories and help us figure out how to go faster. And then with Marty Burke, at the, he's a professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, he built the molecule maker uh, chemistry robot. And so he and I were sitting at a, at a conference together and we both realized we wanted to help democratize science. So what does that mean, democratize science? Well, democratization of science, right now, I get to do research at the Air Force Research Lab there are you know, maybe thousands of us, tens of thousands of us, who get to do research in big, well-funded labs. But that still leaves a lot of people out. There aren't enough of us actually doing research, and I said that because we, materials are still holding things up. We still have to save the planet. And so when we build research robots, not only will we go a thousand times faster for each robot, but the cost of each robot will go down. We'll get it down to $300 for a 3D printer, maybe $1,000 you know, for a, 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 an electron microscope. All of, the, as all of those costs go down, then more people can have access and do research. So it's not just that we do research faster, but that more of us are able to do research. And that means that we have a rise of citizen science. So if you have a problem that you want to work on, maybe you aren't in a big lab. Maybe you, know, you have a, a job at a bank or something like that, but you have an interest. You have a question that you want to answer. Or maybe you have a loved one who has a disease that we talked about earlier. 
Maybe there's some rare disease that NIH can't afford to pay for because it's too rare. There are other problems that they have to work on. But guess what? If research becomes cheaper, then those of us who care very strongly about smaller problems can get those problems done. So not just the big problems, but the small problems. And so that's when people democratize, so demos for people, uh, get to decide what science gets done. So I ask you to imagine there, what if we were a society of a billion scientists? What would we do? So I'll come back to, um, to Rick's call here, um, and I'll just say, the end for us, I mean, I'm, I've got, you know, maybe 10 more years in my career. Um, you folks are just getting started out. And the, the problem for us is that even with the great scientists who work at AFRL and other places in the country, by ourselves, we're not smart enough. We're not rich enough. We're not powerful enough to solve all of these problems. But together, we are smart enough, we are rich enough, we are powerful enough to save the world and do the other things that need to be done. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to answer any questions. We have one. Hey there. Um, I, I've got two questions for you, actually. One is more technical, and one is maybe more um, human-based. Uh, first of all, you talked about ARIES, your uh, machine learning algorithm for testing carbon nanotubes. That's very cool. Uh, I'm just, and you said we need, uh, you said two things. We need more carbon nanotubes, and we need more uh, humans. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you know, we, we don't just need more carbon nanotubes, we need a, more of a certain type of carbon yep. nanotubes. Yep. I was uh, curious if ARIES tests for uh, the kind of nanotubes that we need, I, I think that's like chirality is yeah. part of your research, right? Yeah. Could you speak a little bit on that? Sure, yeah. Um, so with the, the Raman spectra that we look at, we're not able to say exactly what the chirality is, we can tell what the diameter is, uh, and we can also say whether it's got defects or not, but so we get most of the answer, but not the full answer. We still have to go back into the lab and do the special Raman or electron microscopy, but that's a really good point. But we, we do think, we're, we're getting ready to publish a paper here, we do think we have a huge leap in understanding that will get us to that, that hundreds of millions of dollars or pounds per year scale. Do you, uh, do you have an estimate of like the percentage of carbon nanotubes that you produce that are the we, um, we were able to, um, using ARIES, we were able to improve the selectivity. So chiral selectivity, by the way, just so you understand, who has the, the nanotube model? There we go. So if you take that nanotube and you give it a little twist, all of a sudden it goes from conducting electrons better than copper to being a better semiconductor than silicon. And you can use it for light emitting diodes and lasers and all these different kinds of things. Except that when you grow them, you grow all different kinds of carbon nanotubes, all of the different chiralities. And so what we were able to do in a paper we published a couple years ago is to show that uh, we improve the, the selectivity, how well we grow only one kind of nanotube by f a factor of 5x. Um, so we're not there, but we're in the right direction. All right, and last question. Um... So we talked about how we need more carbon nanotubes, but we also talked about how we need more humans in science. Um, and I think a, little, a, a lot of that today is with you students. Um, I wanted to reference your Billion Scientists program, and I wanted to maybe um, encourage you to talk a little bit more about it and, and your diversity and inclusion aspect, um, because science is, is a dominated field by um, white males, like people who look like me, you know, or the people that look like the people that we are, are inducting into the Hall of Fame, right? But that's not necessarily our future, right? Our future lies in minority groups, yeah. in women, 
African American Hispanic populations that are underrepresented in the field of science. Um, could you speak a little bit more on, on how your program is encouraging those groups? Right, now that's a great point. Thanks, Preston. Um, I would say um, there's, there's a lot of different ways of going about it. What, a lot of it is direct outreach. It's about reaching out to DECA directly and saying, how can we work together? So it has to be intentional. Um, the other part to it is really making sure that we have that contact sport. And by the way, I have um, my uh, contact info. It's got a QR code. Um, anyone who's interested in connecting with me uh, directly, uh, please come up and give it a scan. And to your point, Preston, um, a lot of us who got into science had people they knew in science. Um, a lot of times, you know, barriers to people of color, to women, uh, don't have those contacts. So if anyone in this room needs a contact, just come see me. And uh, we'll get you a tour of the lab. We'll see how it's going, see what your interests are, see what we can do together. So I think that's, that's um, part of it is, is just try and be that example. Um, I will say that at AFRL, I'm trying to push so that um, people at my level, uh, that their review, their performance review, there's a line in there for diversity, equity, and inclusion. I don't know if I'll get it done, but at least that's what I do for mine. Thank you, Benji. Thanks. Yeah, and thank you for your efforts on that. Thanks. Question? Way in the back. All right. Holding the nanotube. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I just wanted to ask if there's other shapes of carbon that would work the same or if not better that you know of besides these two. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's another great question. So, um, yes, that the, is the answer. Um, so here's one. Uh, it's a smaller model, but this is, if you extend this out a long ways into a big sheet of paper, that's graphene. So imagine, you know, one atom, just one atom, can be a buckyball, win a Nobel Prize. Graphene also won a Nobel Prize. Somehow carbon nanotubes got skipped. Um, you know, I'm not bitter about that or anything, but, um, but also diamond, hardest material around, is made from just carbon. Uh, so there's so much that carbon can do, and that's my specialty is carbon. Um, there's so much going on there, and we still have a lot to learn. Thanks. Hazel had a question here. Uh, good morning. I had the pleasure of working for Rick Smalley for two years before he passed away. And during those two years, I got a call from a man named Mark Tyson at National Ge Geographic, and they wanted to build a 20-foot buckyball in the salt flats of Utah and, and videotape uh, Rick on it. Um, that was the last trip that he was able to take. But that interview re resulted in an article published in the June 2006 issue of National Geographic. And it's something that you can easily find. And I think for $3, you can order that article. But uh, it's fascinating. It shows things like how a spider creates its web. And these are pictures that only National Geographic can come up with. But uh, it's really fascinating. And uh, turns out they were not able to build the 20-foot mm -hmm. buckyball because of the weight. Uh, but it, because it was uh, built in water, it, the reflection looks like it. But he is sitting on that buckyball in the article. He's yep. walking with a... I remember that picture. Yeah, it's really a fascinating yep. article. So if you have even the slightest interest, just go to National Geographic and uh, click on the article on... Uh, let's see, it's June 2006. And it's on uh, because Rick was uh, named the father of nanotechnology. So it's really fascinating. Thanks, Hazel. 
Got a questions back there also. Okay, actually we have a couple. So metals like copper conduct electricity because we talk about the, the electron C, that type of thing. Yeah. Can you speak to the fact of how, how yeah. the nanotube actually conducts electricity? That's a great question. So yeah, um, so, so you know, as, as, as you were saying, that if you think of how electrons move in copper in a metal, it's sort of like a bunch of marbles hitting into atoms, and every, every time they try and go a little ways, they run into another atom. And so that creates, that's resistance, it resists the flow of electrons, and that makes copper heat up, right? If you put too much current through a metal, it just starts to glow. Uh, a carbon nanotube is so small that it gets into the quantum aspects where that electron moves from one end to the other for a thousand times further than it does in copper before it runs into something. It's actually a quantum effect. Uh, ballistic conduction is, is what it's called. And that's why uh, that and the higher mobility of, of electrons in, in, in graphite in general is what makes it conduct better than copper. It's, yeah, it's ballistic conduction. It's, it's basically, it, it can't scatter because it's so constrained in, within the nanotube. Okay, I um, want to encourage you guys, you're at a great place in your life and you're about to embark on something amazing and we need you guys. I wanted to find out from Dr. Pagano or even you, like, did you have a process? Did you know exactly what you wanted to do or did you go all over the place and then figure out what it was you were doing or are you still trying to figure that out? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that out, thanks. Um, I was really lucky, and, and I was saying this, because a friend of the family, when I was a uh, junior in high school, um, said, who was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, said um, to my parents, hey, do you think Benji would be interested in working in a lab? And my mom said, I don't know, ask Benji. Um, so he asked me, and I was like, yeah, that's, that sounds great. And um, I managed, I had to really finagle this, but at my high school, I managed to be able to work afternoons at the graphite intercalation labs, which were sort of the, the, the nanotubes of their day, um, doing research, doing experiments, doing material science. Um, and so more than 40 years later, I'm still doing material science, and there's still lots of fun stuff to do, still lots of many more things <laughs> for, that I want to work on than I can possibly do. Um, but I would say I didn't start out to say I was going to do carbon my whole career, um, but I really enjoy research. I really, the, the challenge of going in and having really hard problems and working with smart people and trying to come up with solutions, uh, that's what gets me up every day. And that's what I hope to, uh, to transfer or to find out, you know, if you folks have any of that interest as well. It's not for everybody. It doesn't have to be your whole life. Sometimes it can just be after work, I want to try something out and see what's going on. So I would encourage you to try it out. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, everyone's journey is different in getting to wherever you're going in your life. I still, frankly, haven't decided what I'm going to do when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, case in point, my my son, and I remember the moment that he, the light went on for him. He was somewhere in high school and there was an article about supercomputing, and this was probably 20 years ago, an article about supercomputers, and it said that they will no longer use silicon chips to hold information, it will be carbon atoms. And it dawned on me, what is your brain made of? Mm -hmm. Carbon atoms, hmm, interesting. <laughs> That's he, he went on, just so you know that there is a future in research and doing something other than working for Google, where he was offered a job. They, they like people that are good at math because they like doing all those algorithms and so forth. But um, he uh, has ended up being a college professor, making really, really good money. So it is, it is That's out good. there. There is money in research. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>
by the Miami Valley Communications Council, which has been our great partner in our efforts with, uh, with this year's events. Um, and they will be accessible by your teachers. We'll, we're forming a new YouTube channel, and that will be available sometime within, hopefully, the next few months that, that'll, that'll have uh, every presentation that was ever made and recorded uh, available to you. So no matter where you are in two years, college, still in high school, um, you can contribute to the Engineering and Science Hall of Fame, and we'd love to hear from you by making your own nomination. Anyone, virtually anyone can make a nomination to the Engineering and Science Hall of Fame. All you need to do is contact the Engineers Club, let them know who you are and who your nominee might be. Thank you again all for coming, and we want to thank, give special thanks to you, and especially to your teachers for getting you here, who helped make this attendance possible. Thank you, all applaud you.